morning, everyone. My name is Jordan Sollers. For those of you that don't know me, I manage the community bank relationships for BHC in the state of Kentucky. And I just want to say a couple uh, words of gratitude before I introduce our next speaker. I couldn't help but reminisce on the first KBA show I attended a few years ago. And I got up on stage to introduce the keynote speaker. And I looked out in the crowd and I don't think there was one familiar face. I had just taken the state over, even though I had worked with banks for many years, from a rep that was in the state for 10 years. And today, as I walked up, I couldn't help but think, now there are 30, 40 of you in the room that I consider to be good friends and that I have a phenomenal win-win business partnership with. And the growth of the BHC program in the state of Kentucky over the last few years would not be possible without the support of KBA and the support from all of you. So thank you. Up next, I am very excited to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Derek Kiango and his family fled a civil war in Uganda and settled in the US when he was just 10 years old. Now a successful entrepreneur, Kiango is a renowned expert in environmental sustainability and global health. As the founder of the Global Soap Project, which takes donated, melted, purified, and repurposed hotel soap and redistributes it to vulnerable places around the world. He is also the former CEO of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, which capitalizes on the immersive management and leadership experience he has developed over the last 20 years. Working for Nobel Peace Prize winning organizations like Amnesty International and the American Friends Service Committee. Currently, there are 5,500 hotels that are members of the Global Soap Project recycling program in the US alone. And the participating list of countries is now up to 90. Global Soap recently partnered with Clean the World to make an even more expansive and effective organization. Please join me in welcoming Derek Kayango. Bonjour. Um, I, I know you've been talking about fraud, and I gotta tell you, I'm Nigerian. I'm so delighted to be here with you. Um, who chose the Broadmoor? Jordan, is that you? <laughs> Can we give a big round of applause to Nino for the Broadmoor? Um, and I knew I was coming to speak to very, very wealthy people if I knew it was going to be at the Broadmoor. The bankers, my goodness. But I wanted to do a couple of things this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk to you for about five hours. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell you my personal story. And then we're going to use that personal story to talk about what you're going to go back home and do, which is to really take all the things that you've learned and really personalize them in such a way that you create windows and opportunities to grow your spaces uh, that you work in. And that you create this milieu, as the French would call it, in which uh, your partners, your customers, your, your employees can really feel that the business is part and parcel of who they are. And I'm going to use, of all things, soap. And that's going to be a tough and tall order, but we're going to do it. And then we'll close, if you're lucky, with an African song. Yeah? I'm going to make the bankers dance. Uh, you think that's bad, but you should see me talking to the accountants. They're horrible. <laughs> but they dance, and that's wonderful. And then we will close. Can we do some Q&A, maybe one or two, and then, and then that will be it, okay? And then you can all go back home and, and enjoy yourselves. In, in 1979, my parents and I woke up to an incredible experience. We had gunshots out of the apartment that we lived in, and my father looked out of the apartment and saw a soldier wielding an AK-47. 
And in Swahili, which is an amalgam of Bantu languages and Swahili, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, Arabic, he said the following, get out of your apartment right now, get out. And he was so rude and obnoxious that we knew that if we don't get out of the apartment, he would come inside and kill us. So my father said, let's get out of the apartment. So we get out of the apartment, and we are hoarded up to this roundabout station where we find an amazing scene. And as I walk into that scene, I see my playmates, Masko, her son, and Kukuli, with tears rolling down their faces and their parents holding onto them. And I knew this was going to be a long, long day. So I walk into the scene, and that same soldier with a bullhorn and a rostrum as big as that utters the most uh, uh, painful words I've ever had in my entire life. And he says, last night, two of my soldiers were killed, and I'm here to figure out what happened to those two soldiers. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a firing squad until you tell me what happened last night. A firing squad. We were aghast at this particular accusation because in, in every civilized society, what happens when a crime like that is committed? You investigate the crime. You police the crime. He did not. He went directly to a firing squad. And so, as we start to mumble around, he says, simmer down. Everybody be quiet. Who killed those two soldiers? To no avail, he points four people out at random. One, two, three, four. Come up. And as they bring up those four, we're all wondering what is happening right now. He asked the question one more time, and when nobody's answered that question, he pulled out a magnum pistol and shot all four of them at once. The cacophony that ensued as mothers were screaming and holding onto their kids was just unbearable because then all of a sudden, it is a firing squad. And he yelled at, be quiet, everybody be quiet. We're going to do this all day until you tell me what happened last night. To no avail, another four. One, two, three, four. Come up. And as he pointed at those four, neighbors, neighbors had to point at each other saying, he, he pointed at you. Can you imagine your neighbors right now, KP, that you, that you know, that Jordan has mentioned, that she knows? Pointing you out and saying you committed the crime. Knowing very well that you're going to be what? Executed. It's amazing what people will do when they're caught between a rock and a hard place. So those four people are brought up against their will and there's a little bit of banter between the two of them. I mean the four of them and this young man, a reprobate. And those four gunshots rang out again. That was eight. Before he could pick up another four, a young man at the very back rose his hand ever so gently and said, I, I, I did it. And as we look back to see who this young man was, it turns out he's a visitor in the village and there's no way he could have committed a crime. Nevertheless, he was brought up to the front and there's banter again between the two of them. And I closed my eyes because I could not bear to see another gunshot. And that gunshot rang out again and I could feel and hear his body fall to the ground as he shook to his death. Friends, I was 10 years old watching adults commit an, an incredible crime. And I wondered, what is it about adults that doesn't care about life? That day, began my journey out of my country to go become a refugee. And before we do that, I want you to park that grotesque picture right here. And I'm going to walk you back and show you who Derek was before that firing squad that I survived with my parents to show you who this little kid is. So wake up out of your stupor now and let's walk back to Day zero. So I'm originally Ugandan. Where, do you guys know where Uganda is? How many of you guys know where Uganda is? Really? Oh, wow. That's, this is very impressive. I asked a question not too long ago. I was in a, 
uh, at a speaking engagement, and uh, I asked, where's Uganda? I was in um, California, and the lady, a young lady said, I know where you, I said, darling, where is Uganda? She says, it's, be it's, it's right before you get to Tijuana. <laughs> I said, darling, no. <laughs> so can we all agree that Americans in general are bad at geography? <laughs> So Uganda, let me bring that up, it's right there. It's in the heart of Africa. It's a lovely little country. It's the size of Oregon, and it's a very beautiful country. We pride ourselves in a lot of things. One of the things we pride ourselves in is that, that we are the source of what? The Nile. Oh, my goodness. There is no Egypt if there's no Uganda. Without Uganda, there's no Egypt. So all your civilizations that you kind of talk about start in Uganda. Now, the Ethiopians think that they're the source of the Nile because we have the white Nile and the blue Nile, but they're not here to give the speech, so we are the source of the Nile. <laughs> Number two, we pride ourselves in running. We are great runners. Am I right? We will, we, 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 the Olympics, I mean, everything, every time I see the Boston Marathon, the, you know, the Chicago Marathon, the New York Marathon, and I see where people are running, I'm like, oh, you're going to lose. The Kenyans are here. The Ugandans are here. You know, you guys can go to the moon, but leave the running to us. <laughs> We've got that figured out. We also have the best pineapple in the world. Our pineapple is, every, when you slice a Ugandan pineapple, the juices that ooze out of it, they're like the river now. It's unbelievable. The first time I saw a pineapple in the U.S., I was like, oh, it was so tiny. Big pineapples, great runners, and guess what? the source of the Nile. But that country was given back to us by the British, and we were supposed to govern. We were so excited about this country. It's a great country. We're going to be fantastic. Oh, my goodness. And my parents, who I'm going to bring up in a minute, were so excited. They, be, they were both teachers. And in teaching, they realized that teaching doesn't pay very well. Am I right? Do teachers get paid well in the U.S.? No. Well, I think we should really figure out a way to pay teachers well. So they said, you know what, we're, gonna, we're not going to wait until everybody starts to pay us. Well. We're going to morph and become entrepreneurs. So right before my eyes at the age of five, I see my parents become entrepreneurs. So my dad, believe it or not, became a banker. Whoa. And taught himself how to make soap from scratch. My mother, in the, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, my mother became a wedding gown seamstress. Now, teaching yourself to become a wedding gown is a very tough thing. I joke all the time that she didn't have mannequins for flower gown dresses, so guess who the mannequin was? <laughs> Moi. This is where I dress very, very well. You know, I, 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 I fear that my mother would walk in and go, what is that? You know, so mannequin dressing and all that stuff was fantastic. Now, I'm going to bring up, do you want to see my mom and dad? Oh, that's Uganda, that's the source of the Nile, which is where Gandhi's ashes actually, some of them are spread. He loved the river Nile. That's me. You're supposed to say, oh, oh, you're late, you're bunkers. And, oh, thank you, darling. That's my mom and dad. Why do I bring up that photograph? I bring that photograph up because in my culture, everything begins at home with your mom and dad. Now, not every child has a, a great mom or a great dad, but I did. And I'm telling you, there's nothing as beautiful and powerful as having a great mom. Because they set you up on a path of compassion and love and all that good stuff. And there's nothing as lovely as having a great father. Because they teach you the norms and the traits and all the things that you need to become what? This great citizen. So while in the U.S., a lot of you guys uh, read self, so a lot of books, yeah? Americans read a lot of self-help books, yeah? The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Just seven? <laughs> Five ways of sales and two ways of banking and all that. Well, for us... In Africa, in my culture in particular, it is usually your parents. They teach you those hard things you need to know to become Derek. 
So everything we're going to talk about and how I built the global super begins with them. And so they do very well. My mother becomes the, the, the owner of the second largest David's bridal in my country and becomes very well to do. My father becomes a soap maker and does very well and becomes a banker and does very well. And it's so funny that you guys are talking about fraud because he ends up in a tough situation. Guess who comes into power? And that, remember that grotesque picture we parked over here? Everything was dandy. And guess who gets into power? Idi Amin. You guys remember Idi Amin? Oh my goodness, what a reprobate. So Idi Amin gets into power. And one day, my dad gets a call as a banker. And Idi Amin people ask him to withdraw large amounts of money and put them into the bank where the president was. And he said, absolutely not. But if you know anything about Africa, one of the biggest things that we have a problem with is what? Corruption. We lose a lot. Africa as a continent loses $1 trillion every year to corruption. A trillion. And guess where that money comes to? To your banks. We have all this wealthy, and it's so weird for us because we're not poor. Africa is not poor. We just lose our money to corruption, through our leadership. So it's very easy to find that Mobutu Sesseko, if you know who that is, was the former president of Zaire, will take all his stolen wealth and take it to a Swiss bank, put two, three billion dollars in there, and then he dies. And nobody does what? Claims them three billion. In the meantime, a missionary from the U.S. goes to Zaire to volunteer, and they come up with this wonderful photograph of, oh, for three dollars, you can educate an African child. And then the American, who is wanting to give back through church, through wherever, gives them three dollars to educate what? The African child. In the meantime, guess what? Zaire has three billion in the bank in Switzerland. And so my dad said no, and guess what happened to my dad? Jail. He was put in jail, and he's a vegetarian. He's a born vegetarian, not like some of you who sort of a vegetarian one week and then the other week you're not. If he eats meat, he goes to hospital. He gets hives. So guess what they fed my dad as a form of torture in jail? Meat. He was the only inmate in jail who ate meat. So that particular, particular so the, the war begins and then we get into the sparring squad situation and my father and mother decide we need to leave the country. So my father takes me to Kenya and puts me in the hands of a woman from Pittsburgh to raise me, Marge Campbell. Now, how many of you have, how many of you have ever met Americans before? You only one? Okay, so we can talk about them. Can we talk about Americans? American women from Pittsburgh. Anybody met American women from Pittsburgh? They're crazy. <laughs> the first time I met Marge, she was loud and obnoxious, you know, because that's, you know, it's an American thing, you know. Hey, what's up, man? You know, it's, it's like that thing, boom. The British that raised me were like, hello, darling, how are you? So the first time I met, she goes, what's up, Derek? And I'm like, oh, good God, hello, Marge, how are you? She goes, can I interest you in a cup of tea? I said, absolutely, I love a cup of tea. So she goes and gets a cup of tea, brings back the cup of tea, and goes back to the kitchen. I take the cup of tea, I sip the cup of tea. It was cold. Faux pas. I set it back down. She comes back and does what American women from Pittsburgh do. And she can help us sort of interpret this. And she goes like this. What's wrong? And I said, darling, I think you forgot to put the tea. She goes, no, young man, that's American iced tea. You should love it. And I said, okay. You still forgot to cook it, though. 
And that began our friendship. Marge and I became very good friends. She taught me how to eat uh, uh, cookies, you know. What do the British do? What do they eat? Biscuits. But I've been here long enough to know what you guys do with biscuits, yeah? Americans give them to their dogs. <laughs> this is me shopping for biscuits with, at the supermarket and their dog biscuits. <laughs> Don't do that. Leave the British alone. You won. 1776 is done. You guys did great. Leave them alone, okay? So Marge and I become good friends, and she says, you've got to go to the U.S., so I, go to, I come to the U.S., and I land, as Laura Dan mentioned, in the city of brotherly love. What city is that? Philadelphia. If you've never been to Philly, you should go. They eat weird food. It's called, uh, what is that long thing? Cheesesteak, that thing, yes, long. Very interesting food. So I get in there, and I walk into the, the hotel room, and it's copacetic, just like one of these rooms. It's a beautiful hotel room, and in there... Lovely white bedding, the pillowcases, and I go into the bathroom. And in the bathroom, there are three bars of soap. Facial soap, body soap, and hand-washing soap. What's the difference? None. It's Americans being bougie. <laughs> Nobody else in the world has facial soap and body soap and hand-washing soap. It's just soap. So my father made soap. I'm going to do what? Take the two bars, steal those, put them in my bag for another day. So as you talked about fraud, I, I steal soap for a living. <laughs> How many of you have stolen soap from a hotel before? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a lot. So I come back that evening, and guess what they'd done? They had brought more soap. But I'm going to do what? Steal the heck out of that soap. I'm a former refugee. I can do that. So I take the two bars. So for three days, I'm stealing soap. Then I realize, actually, they're going to charge me for it. So I said, no, no, no. I, can't, I, can't, I don't have enough quid. I can't pay for it. So I take all the stolen soap, and I take that back to, to give them back to the concierge. When I get downstairs to the concierge, the concierge was African-American. I had never met African Americans before in my entire life. The only time I had an, an experience with African Americans was through the movie Coming to America with Eddie Murphy. <laughs> so I was dying to walk up to him and to say, Yo, what's up, brother? So I walk, and he's elegant, and this, you know, because African American men are so elegant. Even the way they walk is elegant. I mean, the courtyard, you know? I mean, they, who walks like this? What's up, brother? That is unbelievable. We're in rhythm. So I walk up to him and I'm, I walk up and I say, what's up, brother? He says, what's up, young man? I say, I say, can I help you? I said, yeah, I have a secret for you. He says, what? He said, I've been stealing your soap. What? Like from housekeeping? He, I said, no, 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 no. You keep on bringing me soap. I can't afford it. Take it back to housekeeping and tell them not to charge me for it. He burst out laughing. He said, are you African? I said, no. He said, are you Nigerian? I said, no, no, I'm Ugandan. He said, Derek, don't worry. It's already worked into your price, yeah? So you already paid for it. It's already worked into the, it's backed in. I said, really? He said, yeah. So as I walk away from him, a thought comes to mind. What about the partially used bar of soap? What do you do with those? He says, we throw those out. I said, what? I just said, once. He said, well, you know, we are an elegant hotel. You know, if you use it, we, you know. I said, just this hotel or every hotel in the U.S.? He said, actually, Every hotel in the U.S., once you open that, you have, they have to throw it out because Americans are get are what? Bougie like that. So I said, wow. So I go back to my room, and I, I lose it. And I think to myself, my goodness, I'm, I'm in a, an incredible country where what? People throw the soap. How much soap is thrown away? So as I ask that question, I said, wow. That's my hotel room. That's the little bar of soap. How many bars of soap do you think American hotels throw away every year? Just take a quick guess. Okay, let, let's see whether the number I'm going to bring up makes sense for you, okay? Every year. That is 2.6 million bars of soap every single day are thrown away in the U.S. And what is even much more modifying is that not all of that soap that is thrown away has ever been used. 
In fact, I got a, a call one time when I built the Global Soap A hotel was changing its brand of soap because the hotel name had changed and they couldn't do what? Use the soap they had in storage because it was not compatible with the brand. So they called me, they said, look, my name is so-and-so, I'm a general manager here, I'm a new general manager, and I heard about your story. Can you come pick up the soap? And I said, really? How much soap do you have? He said, we have five tons of soap. And guess where they were going to throw it in? In the ocean. It was South Carolina. So I had to drive all the way to South Carolina and pick up all that soap. It's amazing. Amazing how much we throw away and what is in our landfills in the U.S. It's amazing. Now, you can look at that number, if you're Derek, and think two things. You can either look at that number and say how wasteful Americans are, or you can do what my father did, which is to tell me, do you know what America is? When you go to America, do you know what America is? I said, it's a country. He said, no, it's much more than that. America, to my dad, is an experiment. It's this idea that when you come to the U.S., you can either complain about everything or you can construct. And indeed, it's an amazing thing. How old is the U.S.? Seriously, how old is your country? <laughs> 260? In 260 years, look at what you've built. Just think about that. Because at this point, we are all questioning the validity of this country. We don't know whether it's going to be here or not. It's going to be here because what? We have constructors. Compl if you want to complain, I mean, I don't know, go to Somalia or something like that. But if you want to construct, you come to the U.S. So you look at that number and you remember when you're flying into over New York and you see, you know, the, la the wonderful ladies that you... And you think about yourself, I'm going to turn that number into business. So you ready to talk about business? Let's talk about business. What do you do to take 800 million bars of soap that are used, partially used, and turn them into brand new soap into a, into a $10 million business? How do you do that? You have to be very, very clever and smart, innovative. So I'm going to walk you through those steps, the steps, and let's see what you think. So what do I do to clean the soap is the first question. Because the FDA is not going to say, oh, there's a Ugandan refugee who just came to the country and is recycling soap. And is. No, they're going to do what? Test the bloody thing. <laughs> Make sure there are no germs on there. They were asking for 12 pathogens to be cleaned off of that soap before they could give me what? Clearance. Because Americans will sue you behind from here to high heaven if they use that soap and they got a rash. Secondly, the hotels needed to be, to, be, to be given proof that I had killed all the germs on the soap. So what do you guys think I did to kill all the germs on the soap without altering the pH system of the soap, which is the chemistry of the soap, for those of you who remember your chemistry class? What do you guys think I did? Anybody? What do you think I did? How do you kill germs, not alter the soap, Boiled it. That's a good thing. You can boil because anytime you boil anything, something dies, yeah? But if you're an accountant, what is the problem with that solution? The cost. The utility cost. So, <laughs> one more. What do you think I did? Bankers, you just talked about, how are you going to go back and defeat fraud if you can't even think of how? <laughs> think. What do you think I did? I cooked? The, 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 no. Washed it? Oh, froze it. Darling, there are germs in Siberia that have been frozen for a billion years. <laughs> because of weather heating up, they're now coming alive. And that's one of the things I was brought here to talk to you about. That in, as you go back to solve these problems that you're talking about, you've got to be clever. 
think outside of the box, really out of the box. And sometimes it can be right there in the box. But you've got to be clever as you go back home. Be clever. So this is what I did. I was being observant, and I was asking myself, how do I kill those germs? Then I remembered germs in chemistry and biology are like you and I. They, they, uh, they eat, they dance the macarena, and they, they have children, and then they eat us. So they breathe. So one day I'm watching telly, and this young man comes up with a contraption that does what? He takes a pl- slice of meat, puts it in the, the, the plastic bag, and sucks the air out. Have you seen that? And, puts it in, and ha- it preserves the meat for a longer period of time. I said, oh my God. So I go downstairs, and basically I take the soap, I look at it, I say, oh my. so I buy the contraption, crush the soap, put in the, suck the air out, and create what? A vacuum. And I wait for two weeks, just for good measure. I go to the lab, I give the soap to the lab, they test for 12 pathogens, and they call me back and say, Derek! And I was like, oh, good God. I thought it did not work. Come into the office, I go into the office and say, what did you do to kill the germs without altering the chemistry of the soap? And they said, are they dead? They said, all of them are dead. And the soap is good? He said, the soap is fantastic. I said, okay, I will tell you the secret if you give me clearance. And they gave me clearance. I was the first person in the world to figure out how to kill those germs without altering the chemistry of the soap at zero cost. That's what it looks like. I have a factory in Vegas. Why Vegas? A lot of sin soap, am I right? That's where you guys go to sin, and I cleanse your soap. <laughs> a lot of soap. In, and in business, it's always location, location, location. Am I right? So I went right into Vegas, partnered with all these hotels, the Bellagio and all of them, and they became all my friends, and they gave me the soap for free because they were, this was part of their corporate social responsibility. So they said, it's all yours, hands off. They were giving me what? Business, baby, business, for free. I have a factory in Orlando. Why Orlando? Mickey Mouse soap. Oh, yes. I highly recommend that one. We have one in Hong Kong, in Italy. and I think they're building one now in England. I've lost track. And so, we began to do what? Recycling the soap. The first thing that you guys are thinking about is the yak factor, am I right? Who's going to use that soap? It's already used. And I told my son, I said, Kevin, I have found my calling in life. It's to recycle soap. He said, like what? What, what do you mean recycle? I said, use soap, recycle, and make it brand new. And this is what he told me. Yak? Why don't you just buy Irish Spring or something? And give it to Because <laughs> it's bougie, like you guys. So I said, okay. The first step is to peel. What you just use, then we get into the inside piece of the soap, then we crush, then we ziplock the soap for how many weeks? Two weeks. And then we open the soap back up, and that time it's very dry. Very, very dry. It's like laundry detergent. Then we put it back. This was my first contraption, my experiment. Uh, what is that? A cement mixer. Thank you, Home Depot. So I put it into the cement mixer, and then I add a little bit of moisture to the soap to create a feta cheese kind of texture. So I can put it in the machine, and then I push it right through the machine, and out of that machine comes that. Those are University of Michigan students who came to volunteer at the factory, and in one day, they recycled all that soap. All that would have ended up in your landfills, which is part of your water table, and as you guys wonder why you sometimes are not healthy as you drink your water, it's because you allow these chemicals to penetrate through and permeate through those water tables. And soap is one of those chemicals that is really bad for landfills. It slows down, because it's a chemical, it slows down the what? The organic process of what? Metabolization of the landfill. It's very bad for landfills. So here we are. Oh, fashion, of course. That one box has 160 bars of soap. 
And if you give it to a family of four, it will last them for a whole year. And those of us who are interested in health, that's a big deal. And so we get to then ship, the, so that's, that's, that's going to uh, a country called Liberia. Why Liberia? At the time, there was a new disease called Ebola. You remember Ebola? And Ebola's way of being, and I find my work so relevant today because Ebola is all about cleanliness. COVID is all about what? Washing your hands. Wash your hands. And so we have to ship all this to Africa, to Latin America. So here's a second business lesson. What do you think I did to move that so from Vegas all the way to Kenya, Liberia, at zero cost? Come on, bankers, talk to me. What do you think I did? Because business is about, in business, it's the, the more clever you are than your competitor, the more what? Successful you are. Be clever. Just so, yes, you're a bank. Okay, so what? There are so many banks. What separates your bank from the next bank? And that's why you're letting all these competitors, their PayPal and all this, that they're in your space. What, what is a traditional bank going to do to remain competitive? So what do you think I did to move that soft from Vegas to Kenya at zero cost? Now, of course, there's a cost, but to me, there was no cost. Who paid it? I gave it away, donated, but I'm talking about shipping. I did ship it. Oh, did you say that loudly? Contain, this is why I love bankers. They're smart. Nobody has ever thought about that. So let's go back into the clever part, okay? What is Vegas? Is Vegas landlocked? What does Vegas export every day? What is made in Vegas that leaves Vegas to go all over the world? I'm sorry? Elton John. That's what they export. So that means that everything that goes to Vegas is a truck with what? Full commodities, yeah? The trailer parks are full. But when they leave Vegas, what do they live with? Nothing. But in accounting, that space still has what? Value. So what I did was to go to the shipping company and I said to them, look, as a non-profit, because I had a, profit, a non-profit side to me, if you donate that space to me, how much would it cost? And they said it would be about two, three thousand dollars to move the container to Vegas. I said, if you donate that space, I can write you a what? Ah. And say that you donated that space or that you donated to my organization three thousand dollars. And I got one million dollars of free shipping space donated to me. So it was the containers, it was the shipping companies. All of them are coming back, what? Because they're coming from China with stuff that you guys buy every day at Target or wherever you buy stuff. And they're going back, what? Empty. Zero. Clever. Be clever when you go back home. Start being clever. And so we get... To Uganda and Kenya, and I'm going to give away the soap. What do American mamas say when you give them a gift? What do you guys say? There are two American women in here. Thank you. Have you ever seen an African woman say thank you before? Can I show you? And they, it's called an ululation, yeah? And they cry and they, they are happy and they give you their daughter to marry. I have 5,000 wives. I told that joke in Utah did not go very well. <laughs> they love me in Utah, but they just love me. My wives. No, I'm just kidding. 
it's one thing to be clever about business and do something remarkable. It's another thing for your business to be part of solutions in the community. And so as a bank, the more you are part of the community and the more you engage the community, the more they remember that you are a good what? Bank. It's not just about numbers. Even for me with Global Soap, it's not just about me being clever and recycling a soap. And that kind of thing. But to go and solve a problem, the, the global health problem in most of these countries is about hygiene. Girls drop out of school in Malawi because boys make fun of them about hygiene. And when we introduce soap, just an, an, a small idea like soap, we introduce that into the school system for the girls to wash because most of our schools are, are boarding schools, yeah? And as the girls wash and feel clean and feel lovely, the truancy rate of girls went down. And that's what they look like when you respect the community. If your bank can do the same thing, I can guarantee you, you get more trust out of the community and guess what? They will bank with you. They will bank with you. Some of your banks, people are leaving because what? They don't trust you as being a good member of the community. Bona fide. Girls love soap, boys do not. Which is why in my tradition, we don't shake hands. Usually when you say hello, you say, don't touch me, you bloody bastard, don't touch me. <laughs> Namaste. Because <laughs> once you touch somebody's hands, the, the, the germs do what? Propagate. And when you do that, then the cost of expense in terms of health charges, uh, uh, become very expensive. The per capita income in Uganda is $390. Are they going to afford to buy a bar of soap at 50 cents? Because that means that every day they earn how much money? If the per capita income is $350, how much do you think they earn a day? Do some math. Less than a dollar. And all that is coming back to one thing. Your fraud here is nothing compared to our fraud back at home. And we are paying a heavy price as a continent. And the price is not being paid just by us alone, that corruption that you see that you guys have talked about, but you're going to start paying it here. And it comes in this form. If you've been watching Europe, the immigration movement of Africans from the continent to Europe is overwhelming the Italian system, the French system, the British system. In the US, the immigration rate is being brought over by the Central Americans because what? We are not paying attention globally to these dying societies because we are letting one thing and one thing alone destroy them. It's poor leadership. And through poor leadership and lack of us communicating creates corruption. It is a, a, an abomination that an African leader can steal $32 billion from Angola and take it to a Western bank and deposit that money there to no question. And we have done questioning. We are questioning Vladimir Putin. Yeah? We're getting the yachts. We, we, we take the oligarchs who have stolen money from the Russian people and we question them. Why can't we question that fraud in Africa? Because if we don't, you will always give that Sunday school money at the church, the $20 to educate an African child. 20 bucks. And what do you get when you educate a child at 20 bucks? Nothing. You don't get a dairy because I was educated here. I went to your, one of your best schools in Boston. And so my role as Derek right now is to educate you guys on how fraud and corruption in Africa, in all this, is creating dying societies that are going to overwhelm you at one point. We are 1.4 billion. And what you did with China and all the other, Japan, and you enable them to become business people, 
they now are strong. They don't have to migrate. Japanese don't migrate to the U.S. They're doing well. You, you, you empowered them. In fact, at one point, Japan's economy was the second most what? Powerful economy in the world. So rather than us competing on who steals from whom, let's just compete on who makes the best Volvo. Let's be clever. So that's a global community that is dying, but what about your local community? Do you have the same symptoms that are showing up? And what can you do about it as the community of bankers? And there's a lot you can do. So I'm going to conclude with something. Oh, look at that. Isn't that lovely? That is a little kid that was, I, I gave this organization soap for the first time. It was built, uh, the organization that is, is an orphanage that was built by a young girl from Alabama. This white kid came over to, to do a, a missionary trip, and she stayed and built an orphanage in Kenya. And she didn't know that we have malaria, and she died of malaria in Kenya. But her work lives up to now. She has done more than many human beings I know in bringing a little bit of God's kingdom here and Africa. Oh, and if you're lucky, they give you a child when you're living. So that's my child, and they're following me, and they're laughing, and we're going to have lunch and dinner. We're going to have lunch. Let's, control, let's con conclude with... Uh, 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 when we were talking, in there, we were talking about how do we send our friends back home with this particular idea of self. Most of you guys are accomplished, and there's no reason for us to even talk about accomplishment, because we're already accomplished. But what we are worried about is how you are doing personally. How are you doing? What motivates you these days to go to work with this zeal, and this ability to recreate new avenues of what? Success for your corporation. And I think that if we go back to the equation which is you, and not focus on everybody else, but you, as a banker, as an accountant, or as a, whatever you do at the bank, that we need for you to come back to yourself and develop a new diction, a new set of things that you can call Derek, self, me. And so rather than read an expansive book, we would rather you read you and see where are you now. And where are you going? How are things happening? Are, are you okay? So for me, self is this. It's an acronym that I came up with because sometimes we think we're wonderful. I have a BMW, I have a four-bedroom house, everything is fantastic. You will be surprised how many of you are not doing well. Emotionally, physically, kids, marriage, all that stuff. That whole thing at home in self, you, affects the way you do work. In fact, most innovative people are damaged goods. We are so damaged, man. Because we are so smart, we are very clever, we are constantly doing everything else except us. So for me, the first thing is self is, the more your bank serves, the more you serve through the bank, the more the bank becomes what? Because the bank is, a, is you, it's not a building, it's you, you are the bank. If you don't come to work and serve, the bank is not the bank. And I laugh about the Mormon kids, and I, I make fun of Utah, but I love Mormons for one reason. When a Mormon child graduates from high school, what does he do? They go for service. For how long? Two years. And that creates character in them. That's how Mitt Romney learned French. Service. And we think it's just for kids. Yeah, the girl calls. No, no. Service is a, is, is, a, is a lifelong thing that you do. Because when you serve in the community, as a bank or as you, okay, and I see most of you go to build the Habitat for Humanity building, you know, and you do it ceremoniously, you know. Oh, today we're going to, this weekend I was at Habitat for Humanity building. Good. It's not a two-day thing. Service is a daily thing. 
How do you serve daily? And that's something you have to think about for you. Because if you serve, you educate yourself on the needs of the community. You get to learn. Whether you become relevant. So the solutions you bring to the community are worth learned. There's nothing as bad as seeing somebody who is serving and they are not informed. It's the same thing with the, as Africans when I was a refugee. We had people come from all over the, the, the world to bring us things that refugees need, yeah? They call them care packages, yeah? It's nothing as funny as an American or a Brit or somebody from France bring you winter clothing when you live on the equator. Lack of education is dangerous. It makes you look what? Disconnected to the community. If you serve and if you're educated, then your bank, through you, can become a leader in the community, a credible leader. Don't be a leader because people are following you because you have money. That's not leadership. I have many friends who are very wealthy and we all pontificate around them and we succumb to them because what? They have money. It's like a girl who has an ugly guy and she's falling in love with a guy because the guy has money. Not because she really loves him. Don't use money as a bank to jive yourself into a leadership position. Rather, use your leadership this way. First serve, educate yourself, and then show what? The money. Don't throw money at problems. That's not how we solve problems globally. It's the same thing I tell the U.S. government. If you give Africa aid, because the African president just came and said, oh, Uganda, we need food, we need food aid, oh. And, you know, the U.S. government says, oh, here's $9 billion. Oh, go, thank you, boo, bye. And then they come back when? Next year. How long are you going to give $9 billion? <laughs> Serve first. So all my friends in the Marines or wherever, when you talk to them, they, when they were in war, they first do what? Learn, serve, and then they do what? The work they have to do. And then lastly, faith. Uh, it's not the religious faith per se. That's fine if you have faith. But having faith in yourself is based on how good you do the other three. So as you go back home, does your team really have faith in you? Do they have faith in you? I was watching the Jets play the other day, and somebody said to the coach, do you, does, does the team have faith in the quarterback? And the coach said, yeah, I mean, that's our quarterback, because you know how they think, it's our quarterback. But we all know you are not the quarterback they want. Are you the quarterback that everybody goes, mm. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, team is our president of the bank, <clears throat> but is there that little silent voice that has no faith in you? Because you're not serving your fellow employees, your fellow bankers, your fellow community members. You're not educated in anything. And you're a leader by proxy. Go back and build faith. I'll leave you with a quote, and then we can end with a quick question. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I want you to go back home and seek balance. Be balanced. Be healthy. Be kind. At the same time being what? True to your science. Um, be consistent as a bank. Be consistent. I, I, and I, consistency is very tough. I mean, you see all these cars being recalled all the time. <laughs> my soap could not be recalled because I would be sued. My soap had to be perfect. <laughs> and yet I didn't seek it. But I had to do a great job. Be just as a bank. My, my dad, in, 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 in refusing to give Idi Amin that money, jailed, and all that stuff, he ended up joining the rebel movement that overthrew Idi Amin. Now I can say this because he's retired. Uh, my father was a spy for 15 years. How do you 
No. And we think that that horrible sin, you remember the firing squad skin? I think they were looking for somebody, and it turns out it may have been my dad. Those are tough options. The war ends, and my dad becomes the head, the deputy head of our CIA, yeah? And then becomes retired out of that particular situation and becomes a member of parliament. And then becomes now a presidential advisor on security issues. But his work was that he fought in the war, served, got to know the needs of the community and became a just man. Are you a leader who's just? As you go back home, check that. Do you have passion? Or are you deflated? Because in looking at self, we need for you to be passionate. As you can see, I'm very passionate about what I do. Do you still have the same passion today that you had when you first got the job? And if the answer is no, that's fine. We all sort of lose passion every time. We but go back and find that passion. Because if you do that, you bring meaning to humanity. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's do uh, one question, two questions. Whoever has a question, just let me know. Don't say, do we have lions? Yes, we do. That's not the question. No, oh, I did a bang-up job. No questions. Thank you very much. God bless. <laughs>